public support and everybody. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming to discuss this extremely important <clears throat> topic with us today. I'm Catherine Bell from Quartz, the global uh, business and economics news site. And I'm here today with an absolutely tremendous panel who I will introduce in a moment. When it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are at a very frustrating state of affairs at the moment, where we are moving forward and backward at the same time. Since we all la last met in Davos, companies have made real progress pushing DEI initiatives further up their agendas, and investors have started taking the S in ESG more seriously. But COVID, and the, more recently the war in Ukraine, have really set us back. Um, they have it, exacerbated inequalities and delayed progress on a number of fronts. So the, the global gender gap, for example, has been extended by a full generation. LGBTQI um, and, and women's rights are under intense pressure in many places. And two years after George Floyd's murder, the racial equity movement has lost some momentum. $67 billion were committed by major global corporations after that, and only 1% um, of that has been actually dispersed. So here we are. Um, we've been hearing a lot about the outlook for the economy, and, and that is worrying because, as we all know, when the economy goes in a negative direction globally, um, underrepresented <coughs> groups are uh, disproportionately affected. So what we want to do is take this as an opportunity to make sure that we build in a way that is truly <laughs> inclusive and that, that ends up in a place that's better than we were before the crisis. And so we have a, a fantastic group of people here from all sectors to talk about how to do that. So first, we have Ilham Kadri who is the CEO and chairman of the executive committee of Solvay in Belgium. We have Peter Grauer, who is the chairman of Bloomberg. We have Petra de Suter, who is a deputy prime minister, also of Belgium, and also minister of public enterprises and public administration. And finally, we have Nadia Murad, who is a Nobel Peace Laureate. She is the president of Nadia's initiative and the co-founder of the Global Survivors Fund. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. So, um, Ilham, I'd like to start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you work in the chemical industry, mm -hmm. which is not um, known as an industry in the absolute forefront of DEI initiatives. Can you talk about what your biggest challenges have been over the last couple of years and, and what steps you're taking to tackle them? My personal challenges. <laughs> well, the, the challenges that your company is facing yeah. and industry yeah. is facing. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm indeed uh, very proud to represent the industry and the chemical industry. Well, first of all, um, I'm here probably because I'm a pure product of inclusion and diversity and equality, right? And I'll start by saying if I can do it, everybody can do it, right? And it started uh, by my uh, upbringing by my grandmother, illiterate grandmother, who raised me. I was born and, and lived in, uh, raised in Morocco for 17 years in a very frugal home where sustainability started at home. And she taught me one thing. In Africa, we said for young girls that you have two exits in your life. The first one is from your father's home to your husband's home. So we, we are all asked to, to make a good marriage and be a good wife and a good mother, uh, learn how to cook, etc. And the second exit was to the grave. My grandma illiterate said, well, this is not sexy, isn't it? So she asked all the girls of the family to find their third exit. Mine was education, as simple as that. So to, to, I'm passionate about technology. I'm a scientist and humanist. And you know, I, I abuse of mentoring. I found great mentors, many, many men, by the way, mentors uh, along my career. And uh, I took some trains. So it, it comes with you first, right? And after, when you climb the ladder, obviously, it's not easy in all continents. I lived in the four continents, in Americas, in Japan, in Middle East. In, I worked in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I, I am now back in Europe. 
um, it's not easy and it's universal. It's sobering, you're right, when you talk about the statistics. So at Solvay, and I joined, uh, I'm leading this 160-year-old uh, lady since now three years and a half. And I was wondering, frankly, when I was trying to craft the diversity, equality, and inclusion program, and I reflect on my career, I've been 25 years in the industry, I always failed in the DE&I. <laughs> I must confess it. Because, you know, the diversity is a statistic. The <coughs> inclusion, I would put the I before the D. So at Solve now, we launch what we call Solve One Dignity because it's about putting the dignity at the center of everything we do, regardless if we're a woman, regardless of races, ethnic, religion, sexual orientation, was a taboo in my company. We did, we, now we have LGBTQ employee resources programs. So we really, you know, we decided to craft it around the dignity rather than, you know, pushing the statistics on diversity. Because if I leave today, diver, uh, Solve, and I left diversity before that, um, if I leave Solve today, 99 percent chance that it's a white male, you know, successor, right? So we need a pipeline, we need this education, we need academia, we need policy makers. Uh, I must say now we have 48% uh, in my senior leadership council, young women, we are, you know, grooming them, sponsoring them, mentoring them, etc. And uh, you need that education. You need to bring more and, and work on the unconscious bias. And I can talk more, but I will, you know, uh, honor my 120 seconds <coughs> target. <laughs> Thank you. She's been well tracking done. on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she really means it. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, um, the next step really from, from working with your workforce to make sure that you're doing as well as you possibly can on, on DEI um, metrics across your workforce is to really put those ideas and those values at the center of your business and the center of your business model. And I know that's something that you're committed to doing at Bloomberg. Can you talk about how you're thinking about making that shift and, and why? Yeah, so, so this has been uh, a journey that we've been on for a long time, uh, but really formalized in April of 2014 when I said to our founder and my boss, Mike Bloomberg, that as executive chairman of the company, I was going to put a stake in the ground and really lead the charge internally. Uh, and as is the case with anyone in an institution like ours, you make some steps forward and you make a couple of steps backward and external events occur which influence what goes on internally. But I'm fond of saying, first of all, what, what we are all doing from a DNI perspective, almost regardless of the application, is uh, it's evolutionary, it's not revolutionary. These things aren't going to happen overnight. The second thing that I would say without uh, being too articulate is that we are in a race without a finish line. This never stops. And so my mission and our mission has been to basically permeate the organization with the underlying importance of the value of inclusion in our workforce. We have about 22,000 people that work in 130 countries around the world. We are consistently, every day, in a war for talent. We have to be able to attract people from lots of diverse backgrounds, whether any underrepresented group almost that you can think of, because what we are looking for is that unique combination of people and intellects that bring together and create a unique environment, a unique opportunity for our clients our product offerings. And, and so, so we're on this journey, and I think all of our 22,000 employees around the world understand that diversity and inclusion is a critically important value of our firm, uh, number one. Number two, we all have a responsibility to contribute to the best outcomes that we possibly can. Uh, and, and number three, that responsibility starts at the senior most level in the firm, setting really the tone at the top of the organization. But all of our business, we have 13 separate business units. Each business leader, similar to putting together an annual operating plan, puts together a DNI strategy focused on recruiting, retention, development, and then kind of an all other category, which is give me your best idea. Let's throw the pasta against the wall, see if it sticks. If it does, we'll take that throughout the organization. And, and really benefit more broadly than just doing it in a more narrowly focused environment. 
uh, we review those plans twice a year, once when they submit them, and then in six months we have a formal review. Our head of DNI meets with our managers literally on a monthly basis to make sure that they're on track, and if not, what can we do to make sure that they're on track? But the, the important thing is, as I said at the outset, everybody understands this is a critical part of our business strategy, and we've got to execute successfully to maintain our market position and do the things that we do. I would close by saying, at our company, 85% of the profitability of our business goes to Mike Bloomberg's foundation. And, and as a consequence, it's a tremendous draw for people to come to the firm, which is why diversity and inclusion is so critical to our performance. Because in the end, Mike's going to give away, for example, in the last year, he's given away over a billion seven hundred million dollars to a number of causes around the world, and that really drives us. But the DNI component enables us to have the best performance possible to enable us to give all that money away. Thanks, Peter. Petra, we've seen a lot of evidence that diversity and inclusion increases resilience, mm -hmm. both in, at the company level um, and in the public sector. So what can governments do to make sure that they're including um, DEI um, ideas in all of their policies so that they can create more resilient societies? Yes, well, to, to answer to that, and you uh, alluded to it in the beginning, you said we're only looking at the economy. But if you talk about inclusion, diversity, you are talking about efficiency of institutions, organizations, companies, and so on. So it has also an economic interest. I think we have to stress that specifically to people that do not always understand why this is important. Of course, on, on the, at the, the level of the organization, being more inclusive um, will create a culture where people feel safe, represented, and, and will be happy um, whereas if they are ha having uh, uh, you know, to work in an organization where they're not represented, and I'm responsible for public administration, which means that I really want that the public administration reflects the society that we are serving, that we're working for. Um, I would add that it's not enough to use quota or KPIs, how many people of this and that do we have. Um, you have to take an intersectional approach, of course. I think uh, we will maybe discuss this later. And by the way, it's difficult to, to use quota and find out how many people you have because we don't, do not ask sexual, sexual orientation or, or even people with a handicap. It's very difficult because not all all, all, all people want to disclose this, and so how are you going to increase the, the number of people with, with a disability in your organization? Now, at, at the policy level itself, <clears throat> as you ask, we, we really try to take that, that intersectional approach and to um, uh, use, for instance, the principle of gender mainstreaming in the decision-making that we're doing. Uh, in the COVID pandemic, um, well, we had to take a lot of decisions that affected specifically vulnerable groups in the society. We know that. You talked about inequality that has increased, and the pandemic was, was definitely a, one of the causes for that. So if we take measures, we have all the time to think. Uh, we have to think about what will be the effect of gender equality, for instance. We are now in, in our government um, working on a pension reform. And in that pension reform, the gender uh, dimension is pretty important because we know that there's a lot of inequalities in pension mm -hmm. systems if you compare men to women. So we can try to uh, address these. And in the recovery plan, because you, you're all uh, trying to, to reinvest after COVID uh, and, and we get European money for that, we have added the dimension of gender mainstreaming there. It's very specifically, every project will be also judged on its effect on gender equality. I think it's a positive way of looking at it and trying to improve policies uh, in the work that we're doing. Your point about representation not being enough came up a lot um, mm. in um, both the LGBTQ panel and also the disability inclusion panel that I also moderated this mm. week, where it was such an important point that people aren't just there, but that you listen intensely to them and also that they are really involved in decision making and, and designing and um, and every part of the business. So we'll Can talk I more about that. Just yeah. add a few seconds. There it is. 
uh, important to stress the difference between equality and equity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe <clears throat> not everybody knows the difference. It's very important that you give the right tools to people so that they can enjoy the equality that you want to, to propose. For instance, for people with disabilities, if we want to recruit them in the public service, we offer them reasonable accommodations, as we call it, so that they can really do the tests with the same you know, starting um, possibilities as, as other people with, without disabilities. You have to help them. This is positive action that is absolutely needed to reach that equity rather than just say, OK, we're equal, you are welcome, everybody can, can do. Same thing for gender equality. It's gender equity. Of course, women can enter in the public service, but if you look at the top management, 25% are women. Why is that? That's what we have to address. Right. So we've been talking about a, a lot of progress. At the same time, people's uh, fundamental rights are being violated in many parts of the world. And um, Nadia, I, I wanted to ask you, because you, you work in this area, how are these things related? How are the day-to-day the -day <clears throat> discriminations that people experience in the workplace around the world related to the sexual violence and, and other traumas that are taking place in conflict zones? Well, thank you so much for, for having me. No, sexual violence is, is used as a weapon of war in conflict around the world. Uh, right now it is happening in, in Iraq, in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, in Ethiopia, Colombia, Myanmar, in Ukraine, and in so many other places. Well, historically, rape and other forms of, of sexual violence were seen as an individual side effect of war. Now there is a, a better understanding uh, and that sexual violence is used uh, to, you know, it's used as a targeted strategy to uh, destabilize communities, to destroy uh, victims' lives, to uh, the, dissolve the, the ties that bind our communities. Um, it is important that, you know, recognizing and naming sexual violence for what it really is. It is an important first step. And now we need to, to translate uh, this understanding into coordinated uh, international action to uh, prevent and respond to, to sexual violence, uh, support survivors, and hold perpetrators accountable uh, for uh, not just for terrorism, but for genocide and sexual violence. Uh, we need uh, consistent commitments from the international community to address the root causes of, of gender-based violence uh, through law and, and accountability. With all the devastating news we've been hearing from all of the places you just mentioned. Are you seeing progress on the way that we're uh, approaching sexual violence as an international community at all? This is very slow. You know, um, what happened to me in my community, uh, it was just eight, eight years ago uh, when ISIS attacked my community and they enslaved more than 6,500 women and children uh, into sexual slavery, including myself, 11 of my sisters-in-law, five of my sisters, my nieces, my cousins, and as we speak, 2,800 women and children are still missing in captivity. I mean, there is no way that I, I, I can explain that we have made any progress in, in Iraq for like women and, and children who were taken from their own homes, their own families into sexual slavery. They have been, we, we were bought and sold. We were repeatedly raped and, 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 and tortured. And we have all the evidence to hold the perpetrators accountable and so far we have only seen one case in Germany when last year a German court convicted an ISIS member of genocide and sexual violence. So more is needed and that's why it, it is repeated. You know we are seeing the same pattern repeated in other places and we have seen reports of, of sexual violence already coming from, from Ukraine. So we, 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 have, we have failed to protect uh, the, the, the basic human rights of, of women, especially in, 
in, in Iraq or in, in Afghanistan and, on, and so many other places. And you know where I came from, or, and even here in, in some places in Europe, sexual violence comes with a lot of shame and stigma, and, and it, 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 it's a, a taboo. You know, it's so hard for survivors to speak about it because there is no laws or institutions to, to support them, to stand up for their rights. What do you think are the most important steps the international community needs to take to start addressing this? I think the most important thing, so I have been working with, with my lawyer, Amal Cloney, and the UN member states for like, we, we worked for two years to, to establish the, the UNITA team. It's a UN team investigating in ISIS crimes in, in Iraq. They have all the evidence, thousands of, of survivors have given their testimonies, and, and we have documentation, and ISIS did not hide its intentions of, you know, eradicating our communities, uh, uh, you know, fueling their war by, by using women and, and girls for, for sexual violence. We have all the evidence, and, you know, it, it is hard to, to, to heal and to, to recover without justice. And justice means, you know, held, holding perpetrators accountable, supporting survivors to have a dignified life, you know, I, after I escaped with thousands of other survivors uh, from, from ISIS captivity, we had nowhere to go. We had to go to displacement camps. For eight years, survivors of sexual violence in Iraq are being displaced. They have no basic privacy. They, they don't have job opportunities, no education. How can they, they recover from the trauma? They have been you know, giving their stories times and times without any, any justices, any uh, progress to help them to go back to their homeland in Sinjar or to bring them to, uh, you know, uh, in, in places where they can have asylum. There is only two ways to help survivors in a, a sustainable way, to, you know, help them to access support and justice to go back to their homes and have a you no know, basic services or to give them asylum in, in other countries. We cannot just keep them after all they have been through in, in displaced camps where where they can they, they can't recover. They, they, the, the camps are there are thousands of people in there. You know, there are uh, journalists and other investigators, they go to them and they ask for their stories uh, and, and, and sometimes they, they re-traumatize them. You know, that's why I, I worked with the UK government and uh, last month we uh, launched the Murad Code, which is a, a guide for uh, journalists, investigators, and anyone who is working with, with survivors. Uh, to, to do it in a respectful and, and supportive way because we should not re-traumatize re them. Uh, and we have shared with the government of Ukraine, with the survivors, and we are hoping that, you know, can do more. They, they deserve more. Uh, they've been through a lot. And we, can, we cannot just solve the, the, the issue of gender-based violence, uh, conflict-related sexual violence by just, you know, we cannot just address their trauma. We have to talk about other aspects of marginalization as well. Uh, and and it, sexual violence does not happen, you know, on a, on a vacuum. So, you, I, Nadia, you've talked about um, involving survivors in rebuilding communities and also that, that intersectional way of approaching things that you can't just address one problem without all of the others at the same time. And Petra, I'm wondering from, you know, from, uh, from your position in government and, and looking at policymaking, how you think about incorporating, um, in incorporating underrepresented groups in the decision making that affects them. 
Yes, <clears throat> well, there's so much to comment on what Nadia yeah. said, but I understand we have to, uh, to discuss other t topics as well. Um, I think it's extremely important if you, if you, as a government, as policymakers, say we want to work on more inclusion and diversity, that you talk to the people that you want to involve, of course, that they, they are the ones that, that needs representation, that need uh, their rights to be, uh, to be respected, that need to participate to, uh, to wh whatever policy you are making. So you have to sit with them and talk with them. And I think, um, I, at least in Belgium, uh, we are trying to do that as much as possible. Um, I gave already the example of people with, uh, with a disability that we apparently are not successful in attracting them into a public service, while we are sitting together with their representatives, their organizations to, to see what can be done to improve, to increase the numbers uh, in public service. We have, of course, uh, very close ties to the LGBT community and they have their own groups within the public uh, administration, um, which is much more difficult in Belgium, in, at least in the public administration, is to reach and to attract more people with a migration background. That is really difficult. We do not have data. We cannot really follow up. Um, but of course, I, I started to say the data is not what is really important. Mm -hmm. So we have to do much more of, of an effort to, to reach out and to, to attract the people to, to get uh, for recruitment, for instance, in the public administration. Um, so I think at all these levels, we're trying to do that. And, and then we didn't even discuss intersectionality, of course, right. because if you're a woman of color, you know, your, your situation is quite different from other women and of men of color. I mean, we need to realize that because we usually look into silos and we say, okay, we're doing so many, so much for the women. We're doing so much for people, um, you know, uh, with a migration background or people with a handicap. But, you know, intersectional approaches are more and more important and we need to address them also in the way that we're looking uh, into, into ways to improve inclusion. What do you think are concrete steps that organizations of any type can take to take a more intersectional approach, because you're right, it's it's so siloed right now, mm -hmm. and in reality, all of us have multiple identities happening at once and and affecting each other. What does that look like in practice? Well, <clears throat> to start, um, I would say raise awareness about that, educate people in in your management. So, what we're doing, because of course the, the federal administration in Belgium is quite large, as a number of, uh, of people working there, we train the, the managers, we train the management, we, we explain what we want to achieve, and we have, of course, our policy uh, goals uh, that you set as a minister when you start, and then you say, how are we going to do that? We do a lot of analysis and studies, and that's very interesting, but then you need to, to work with that. And the first thing is to train the management and to raise awareness about all these issues. And very often they will say, well, we're doing whatever we can, and they understand, if you explain them, what unconscious bias is. You, you mentioned that. I think it's extremely important. It's, it's something a lot of people do not understand or they are not, well, it's unconscious, of course, so they're not realizing that they are biased. And then even in the decisions that they make to improve gender equality or whatever inclusion, they sometimes make the wrong decisions. So you have to train from, from the management up, and otherwise you also have to work bottom up, of course, and really have the people that you are working for and with, you know, the voice, so that they can tell, you know, I will tell you what is important for me, and so maybe we can get further from, from that perspective. So it's a continuous uh, work that you have to do. So another thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is that uh, DEI means something very different in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're, if you're in Nairobi, if you're in New York, if you're in Tokyo, the, the, you know, how those things play out is different. And so Peter, I'm wondering from your perspective and from anyone else's, as, as, a, as a company that works internationally, how do you overlay that international lens onto thinking about this? Yeah, uh, I, I think I mentioned at the outset, we're, we're, we have colleagues in 130 countries around the world, so we're pretty, it's a pretty broad sampling. And, and the argument often comes up as to which culture is the prevailing culture. Is it the firm culture? or is it the country culture and the city culture wherever we're operating in around the world? And uh, we have concluded that for us, 
kind of the firm culture is what is the umbrella under which everything else operates. And, and within the context of that <clears throat> umbrella, obviously we want to be good citizens, we want to do the things that are requested, we, we, we want to be better than that. But it's very much kind of the fundamental values of what our company, Bloomberg, is, is all about. But with a heavy understanding that, that <clears throat> we've got to be good citizens locally, we've got to basically address the issues that we should, and in many cases, extend ourselves beyond what other organizations do. Uh, and, and so far, that, that has worked quite well for us. Uh, many of you may also know we are uh, the premier provider of news and data to the financial services community. But on the news side of things, obviously, Bloomberg News is on our terminal, but we're in the media business. We have probably the only global media platform uh, which is Bloomberg Television, both digital and, and obviously over the air. And so we have kind of a different platform that we can also address some of these issues with through our media outlets. And, and we try and be consistent, obviously, but focus on the issues that are important in local environments in which we operate as well. So we try and do it both within the firm, but as I mentioned also before, 85% of our profits go to the Bloomberg Philanthropy, Philanthropic F Foundation. And, and then through that vehicle, we do an awful lot with local organizations to address issues of inequality, to uh, uh, address uh, a wide range of social issues because we feel giving back to the local communities is a critically important part of being good citizens and good partners within those areas. So I'm about to turn it over to all of you for questions, but I have one more question for you, Oham. How do you think about extending, you know, moving from thinking about <coughs> EI internally to extending your company's influence to the industry and, and beyond? Well, first of all, you need to do the job internally. Right. We're not yet there as a company. Um, I have 30% of women. We are, what, 21,000 people around the world across one-third, 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 across the three big regions. 30% women, but when you climb the ladder, less than 20% in the top 30. So it's sovereign. It's not because you have a woman at the top that the problem is resolved. So we have a code of business integrity, which I made it mandatory to be read, to obey to, and to sign it off every year by all employees of, of Solvay. It's new in the company. And there, there is zero tolerance to discrimination, harassment, or racism, etc. We hire and we fire, regardless of your performance, because of the business of uh, business integrity. And then, you know, you know that I belong to the chemical industry, so climate change in the top of the agenda, <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions. So what we did in Solvay One Planet, where Solvay One Dignity belongs to, we put the DNI at the same sense of urgency as the climate and the resources. Is the same. They're By related, the way, right? they are related. They are related. That the most vulnerable they suffer, and it impacts my pocket. You need to walk the talk. So, 15% of my variable compensation is linked to Solve One Planet. So, so it is for the whole organization. So we walk the talk, and then I think a lot has been mentioned from um, training the top leaders, right, on unconscious bias. I have one, everybody has one. Um, hiring with anonymous CVs and resumes to attract more ethni uh, ethnicity and obviously gender. Um, help women to be more ambitious. We have an A effect, A for ambitious and raise the hand, right? We walked the talks as a company three weeks ago. We have published the wages gap between men and women. It's the first time in our history. We promised to close it. By the way, it goes both sides because in Belgium, women at Solve without my salary are paid more than men. So it's not. It's an anecdote, uh, unfortunately, but it's it's the case. Um, we also we realize that we are losing women. Um, during maternity leaves, right? And this is very tough times, including personally, I, I suffered um, during my maternity. So what we've done is that we extended the maternity leave to 16 weeks. We extended it to fathers and co all co-parents, regardless of their sexual orientation. And what's happened is that last year, 200 babies enjoyed their fathers, which is great at Solve. Mm -hmm. So welcome to future fathers who want to enjoy their babies. But what's happened as well is that the LGBTQ communities, right, 
made their, their, their coming out because they have also going up for adopted children or whatever. So, and, 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 and we want to, you know, fa frankly, beyond diversity and the saying, invite diversity to the party and don't forget to dance with it because if not, it will leave you and the best people leave you first. What we are doing is really we are getting this bottom up approach. Are people recognizing that dignity has to be at the center of everything we do? Because if you have it, if you have this respect, if people can bring their whole self at work, we are, by the way, by the way, we're not going to do it because of we're not charitable company. I'm running profitable company, and it impacts the bottom line definitely. On that note, who has questions? <coughs> Thank you everyone for excellent insights this afternoon. My name is Dipankar Trehan. I'm a global shaper from India. Uh, in multiple conversations around DEI, I have observed that the common consensus is if you can share your stories, you can start a conversation. My question really is that historically when people uh, with disabilities, LGBTQ community members, they've shared the stories, they've been rejected, they've been discriminated, they've often been bullied as well. What can we do as a society to ensure and give that psychological safety in schools, in colleges, at workplaces, that the next time a person on the, on the margins wants to share their story, they're not discriminated against and they're not bullied? I'll add a postscript to that, which is in a world where things are in many countries are getting more polar mm. polarized, um, anti-DEI, um, language is being used politically increasingly and so in that so in that context let's tackle that question Petra yes I'm, I'm willing to to start because it's an incredible important and difficult question at the same time I think it um, it starts with having the legal frameworks that protect people um, and and as you know and for instance at, at, at a higher level in Europe, we have established that in, in the workplace. Um, no discrimination on the basis of um, sexual orientation or whatever other discriminatory ground uh, in the workplace. Um, many countries have extended that to other circumstances in society. That's the legal framework. I think you really need to fight for that and it's a political struggle and it is not easy and there is uh, evolutions in different directions today in the world. We know that. We need to be aware of that. But then you're not there yet because we know that even if you have that legal framework it is in the in the minds and the hearts of people that discrimination arises very often in very you know, close surroundings if you talk about coming out um, that you're gay it might be your friends and your family where you have really to you know uh, overcome problems of, of, uh, of discrimination or worse, and not only in the workforce. So it's a two-step approach, but I think the legal framework is very important. That's the political struggle, so that you know you are living in a country where laws protect you. You cannot be discriminated. You can go to court. You have your rights. And the second step is much more difficult, and we know that, but it is also work in progress. We still have to fight for that every day, all of us, in our environment, to your friends and family, um, you know, what the values are that we, we cherish. Thank you so much. Um, my question is regarding, you mentioned like using blind resumes. So I'm working on inclusion of people with disabilities in Latin America. And I want to dig further uh, about your experience using blind resumes because in ours, blind resumes can get you to an interview but if you're not removing the bias, yeah. nothing is changing. I mean, it's delivering for their frustration and, and it's not working for anyone. No, it has to go together. It's, it's an excellent question. Um, I actually trained my top 100 leaders on unconscious bias. And I sat with, with them because I have an unconscious bias. When you look at me, you say, oh, she's not from Scandinavia. She's probably African, Arab, whatever. So I think the unconscious bias is part of us, right? And we need really to be trained and remind ourselves during interviews, right, about it. So it's about training, educating again and again. At the end of the day, we want the best people and the best competency to take the job. I will never compromise as a business leader, you know, uh, 
about competency, but I'm forcing for the hot mm -hmm. jobs, right? The hot jobs are the senior jobs, right? 50% representation of minorities. Minorities, be it gender, races, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation. So, and, and I'm, I'm not known as a lady of quotas. I've been always fighting mm. quotas in my life, saying I'm not taken because I am a lady, but because of my competency and my CV and my resume and my track record. But I must say, maybe it's age and maybe, you know, before my retirement, I'm wondering, gosh, how I'm going to make an impact and how I'm going to make those minorities more visible. So we are forcing now the 50% of shortlisted candidates to come from the minorities in the interviews, which, which made people think where, where the headhunter comes back, say, cannot find them, you know? Impossible to fight Chinese. I don't have enough Americans in my top 30, while the US is my number one country of sales. Not enough black African American. We started an employee resource now group. Um, so you really need to, to make it as urgent as making money. <laughs> That's it. Uh, really, you know, as urgent as making money. And I think when it's part of your conversation, like now climate and sustainability dashboard are part of our discussion, you will see that we start moving the needle. So let me add a couple of things. <laughs> uh, just, uh, we, we do unconscious bias training uh, once a year for our entire workforce. Mm. The issue on all these things that we're talking about is persistence. Yeah. Yeah. You just yeah. can't take your foot off the gas for a minute because of the intentionality of what we're ultimately trying to accomplish, but also the value of what we're trying to yeah. accomplish. Uh, and, and, and so uh, my responsibility, and I think I, the panel's responsibility, certainly from my perspective, my responsibility is to be an insufferable pain in the ass <laughs> to my colleagues <laughs> and remind them that we're doing this for the greater good and it's not just the right thing to do mm -hmm. for us, it's very much a business imperative. But if, if the leadership, and, and we've been talking about this uh, on the, uh, the stage, if, if the leadership isn't committed and doesn't set the right tone, f you'll fail almost immediately. But if you do it right and have staying power, you'll ultimately get to the end game. But the end game will, as I said at the outset, and please don't forget this, this is a race without a finish line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's never over. And we're never, people in leadership positions should never be satisfied. What's well said? Petra? Yeah, I just wanted to add on the quota. We don't use quota, but we use quota for the selection juries. That's it. Because a jury is, mm -hmm. you know, more, you know, inclined to choose can, from candidates yeah. that are representing themselves. So if you make your juries more diverse, yeah. you will have more diverse uh, in top management yeah, positions. Yeah. That is that yeah. is where we do it is. Yeah. And this works, it really works. No, it's an important point from uh, the minister. We, we also have now a hiring group rather than just one manager. Yes. To really ensure, mm. ensure that the decision yeah. is done with, with intersections of views and divergent yeah, views. Exactly. Yeah, it's great, we do it. Hi, uh, like Gabriel, I also work on disability inclusion. And uh, diversity, Katie, I think has become like a bad name. And what we realized while inclusion of disability, it's been really about including value, right? About maximizing value. So in this value inclusion, we have realized a very important insight, and I have a question based on that, that um, there is a competency required. It's no longer about awareness. Uh, it's a knowledge, skill, and attitude, and we call that include ability. And I'll tell you why even along with all that access provision or whatever is done, the level playing field for equity, mm -hmm. it could be that the person has not a good education because they didn't get access to education, couldn't go to a school. And that would be for underrepresented communities and or their language is different. And you know there are solutions for all of this. Just so I had two part question. Mm -hmm. One is, are there things like that that you have faced where you've had to step in? It's not a policy yet and then you made a policy where We'll take somebody on based on skills and not education, et cetera. So you'll notice that it's a decision. That means it's a competency mm. you had to display. So my second part would be really, especially, Peter, I'm wondering whether we, we conduct a training which is on includability. It's a com competency at management institutes. So it's, 
it's more to do with now institutionalizing this. And I just wonder if you know, there should be something done regarding that. So just a two-part question. One is. So it's a two-part question with less than a minute to <laughs> yes. go. Oh. Oh, I'm so, so sorry, yeah. My mistake then. We can, we can, we can take it offline. <laughs> well, listen, yeah, I mean, that's why I started with my personal story of accessing education. At the end of the day, we can dance on our head. It's about having access, girls and minorities, to that education. And that's why, for me, I'm engaging more and more with academia. On, uh, and I have a problem as representing the chemical industry, the industry, but the science, technology, engineering, and maths, there is an attrition, and we lose women uh, along the way. So we are doing a lot for girls for sciences, right, bringing them uh, above and beyond the stereotype that this is not their, their field. Um, but you're right, it's about access to education. And now we have at, in the company, and I know it, that some jobs are uh, almost oversized with specs which are over qualification. And the question is, can we actually uh, review our specs, right, to welcome more, you know, uh, less educated, probably, people? Back to you, Peter. Second. Thank you. We're out of time, I'm out afraid. Of time. But Sorry. thank you Saved all. Saved by the bell. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry Peter. <laughs> I, Damn, that was close. I tried to be fast, but you know, it didn't work. You were all wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. Thank you. And thank, thank you for being here. Yeah, I